Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. We're coming to you on a Saturday evening, fresh out of Beaver Stadium, where we spent a lot of time there today for Penn State's home opener. And as predicted, Penn State reached 2-0 on the season, heading into their bye week. But the story and the way it played out was a lot more different than what we forecasted. 35-point spread, essentially, favored Penn State going into this matchup. They ended up being down at halftime. They ultimately win 34 to 27. So, Daniel, you and I were sitting alongside each other. We shared a lot of conversation in Beaver Stadium today. It went from, oh, this is an interesting start for Bowling Green to, okay, Penn State's on upset alert to can Penn State find a way to put this game away and prevent a major disaster? They were able to get it done. We'll talk about some of the pieces that, that took place for part of that process for Penn State to actually get to the finish line without falling uh, to a, a opponent like this. And by the way, Notre Dame, number five in the country, lost to Northern Illinois on home turf today. So uh, let's call it Penn State dodges a bullet of national embarrassment, but also has a lot of self-constructive uh, items to get to with two weeks before their next matchup at home, September 21st against Kent State. Yeah, a, a group of us are in the press box watching the end of the Notre Dame-Northern Illinois game. And after that ended, I was like, oh, guess Penn State's going to move up in the AP Top 25 uh, tomorrow. I, I don't know what the rest of the results look like at like the 8, 9, you know, 10, 11 uh, level. But yeah, I you just want to avert disaster uh, in a game like this. And I think that things shifted pretty early on in our thinking from, okay, when are we going to see these backups? When are we going to see the, the line changes that I think we anticipated and that we teased uh, you know, on the preview podcast with some of our preview content on the site. I know that on my keys to the game on on Friday, my number one key was get in and get out. I mean, I, I know that. And I put the disclaimer that I knew I was being a little glib in saying that and that Bowling Green is a program that has really elevated itself over the past couple of years. And I think Scott Leffler's done a really good job there when it seemed like he was not going to get anything accomplished uh, at Bowling Green. But I was still like, you got to get in, you know, put up four touchdowns quick, you know, get these starters out, get these backups, get these young guys some work and very clearly did not happen. Um, and, you know, even, and there's not something that I was expecting to see, not something you were expecting to see, but I think that you get to the point where, where a game like this, James Franken called it a dog fight. I think that you kind of shift into that real gamer mode where, okay, we're going to do everything we need to, to get out of this with a win. And it got a little dicey there with when it seemed like Penn State just couldn't put Bowling Green away. And if you let a team like that hang around, like a lot of times bad things happen. But Zachy Wheatley, Nick Singleton, they got there. Penn State's 2-0. and I think at the end of the season, we're just going to see 34-27 and just kind of be like, okay, and move on with our lives. It was a tale of two halves for the defense, and we'll get to that. And it was also a, a kind of a, an uneven performance for the offense as well. There were some explosive plays, but there were moments to really put their, uh, you know, put the knife into the into the and, and twist it a little bit a, a, at the end of this game. And until Nick Singleton raised forty-one yards on the first play of a possession, they were struggling to put this one away in that second half while the defense was getting the job done. So. Look, as James Franklin said, you come out of a matchup like this early in the season, you anticipate you'll have a lot to work on. They have more than they expected to work on coming out of this one. But when you're able to work on it coming off a win, it makes a big difference. And I don't want to make this seem like everyone should be happy that Penn State's 2-0. and Just, you know, the style points aren't there. But I think clearly Penn State, to, to be down at halftime in this matchup, and to get thrashed the way they were defensively. Uh, they gave up more than 280 yards total in the first half. Um, you know, as we'll get to with the quarterback situation across the field, he was sensational. Um, but I thought maybe the biggest takeaway for me is these defenders came away from the matchup, Daniel, whether it was Abdul Carter, Kobe King, Tony Rojas. These were a few of the guys that we got to speak with in post game. They said they learned something about Tom Allen at halftime and in the second half. Uh, the way that Abdul Carter described it was that Tom Allen was built for this. And where Tom Allen goes from being in a world where you're the CEO of a team to the guy who, if you got a problem on defense, it's your problem as the coordinator. Um, and I thought if you're looking for well, you know, a rebound kind of story to come out of this and feel good about it, the defense sure figured out its situation in the second half. And, and I felt like, if they hadn't kind of found a way to play button-up football 
then this would have been a real, real problematic finish for Penn State because I don't know if their offense uh, was firing on enough cylinders in the second half that would have maybe been able to, to, to go tit for tat against Bowling Green. I know that's strange to say, but that's what they were faced with early on was, was matching Bowling Green's possessions and matching Bowling Green's scores. And once Bowling Green stopped being able to move the ball at all, they had six yards in the third quarter, they had 86 yards in the second half. Then we saw what happened, and Penn State was able to, to establish a 10-point lead down the stretch and hold on for a seven-point win. And so, Daniel, to me, I think that's where I focus for, for a positive is the defense, that pendulum swung back in a big way, and they were able to really you know put out a dominant effort for much of the second half. Yeah, it, it felt like between the offense and the defense, they never really got synced up where they have both units really rolling. It was first half felt like really all about the offense. Second half, offense did what it needed to do to get into the lead, but it was a lot more about that defense. And I think that defense that we saw in the second half, that was the unit that we were expecting to see for this entire game, I think. Uh, when you think about the, the quality of opponent that Bowling Green is, when you think about the talent differential that's there, I know that the transfer portal evens things out a little bit. Malcolm Johnson Jr., the Bowling Green wide receiver who had a nice touchdown catch, Auburn transfer. So that's someone who has played and has been with an SEC program, had enough skill coming out of high school that an SEC program viewed him as worthy of a spot on their roster. Um, and so the playing field has changed a tiny bit from that respect. But I just thought that overall, the, the defense in the second half, it just looked a lot more determined. I think I think that front and that second level, um, guys were all over the place, it felt like. You, you started noticing different things. You started to notice it being more disruptive. Um, in the first half, there were guys that had like a couple moments. Abdul Carter coming off the edge to bat down a pass on third down. That was one thing that I remember from that first half. But the second half, it's you're thinking about Elliot Washington seeming to be all over the place when whenever he was on the field. You know, Tony Rojas came up with a couple big plays um, after missing uh, a couple, you know, some series uh, earlier in the game, uh, Kobe King, I thought, had some nice hits. And then you you look at that front, and they're in the backfield more. They're they're meeting the ball carrier in in the backfield, and that was something that in that second half stood out to me a, a little bit more. I, I think yeah, we'll, we'll review some of the individual standouts, and 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 they did emerge on defense. Uh, there was a couple key takeaways late in this matchup. But when we go back to the beginning here, I mean, the deal is Penn State surrendered 17 points before the offense ran its 10th play. And so when I thought about, well, what's gone wrong? Sometimes you you, you see a, a power conference opponent take on a max school and just generally there's there's lethargy. That's that's obvious on the field. You're seeing that they didn't bring the passion. But I, I, I wasn't picking up that. I mean, the offense largely was producing early on. I think by the time that we were in deep into the second quarter, you had Tyler Warren, K. Charn Allen, Nick Singleton, Omari Evans, all 24-plus yard gains through the first quarter and a half or so. And yet they hadn't run their 10th play. And Bowling Greens had, got 17 points on the board. And, and a big catalyst for that was, was the quarterback. I, I, I mean, <laughs> Connor Bazelak. Uh, was looking all world in the first half. Um, and it kind of came apart for him a bit in the second half. But Daniel, um, we covered this with, with, with Bowling Green's beat reporter on our podcast this week leading up to the matchup. And he talked about Basilak being a well-traveled veteran, someone that they can lean on you know, with the experience. But he said straight point, point blank period, he's not a guy that they're counting on to throw for a bunch of yards and, and be that kind of a disruptive presence on offense. They like to lean on their ground game. And yet in that first half, I mean, he was absolute money. And this defense was kind of rolling around on, on roller skates, it felt like, Daniel, in a way that we hadn't seen from them in the regular season in a while. I mean, I, I don't know when you go back to maybe some of that Purdue game in the 2022 season opener when they were able to effectively move the ball a bit. But just thinking about the last couple of regular seasons, I'm keeping the Peach Bowl on its own little, you know, kind of its own deal because of the opt outs and everything else that went into that. Um, but it had been a long time since you saw the defense scrambling like this. We've been so used to that authoritative presence. Uh, but but in this case, it just wasn't there. And, and really throughout the entire first half. 
Yeah, I I think the last time that we saw the the defense look that this discombobulated was probably the Michigan game in 2023, but that was a different animal because that was, that was like, them that was them getting out physical up front. That was Michigan being Michigan and grinding uh or no, that was 2022. I think I said 2023 initially. Yeah, October 2022. Yes. But that was that was just grinding it out you know that was michigan was the more physical team that was bully ball that was james franklin in the uh in the press room after the game saying they need to get bigger um but then you look at today and connor of his luck was really slinging it harold vannon jr was making some really nice catches you know this secondary that after last week we kind of said oh okay they're not missing a beat they sent three starters to the nfl uh, or to the you know they three stars moved on great they're in good shape uh, and that really wasn't the case today um, you know, there were some moving parts back there but overall those Bowling Green receivers and pass catchers are really just making some plays downfield and I was surprised to see it but I think that Connor Basilek that's a quarterback that has that SEC and Big Ten experience kind of like I mentioned earlier with Malcolm Johnson Jr. Um, you know, there's a reason these guys transfer down and some of that is their, you know, they can't play at that level. Some of it is other reasons, but you know, it's, they still have that experience. And I think there's a reason those guys end up at that level to start and that shine through a little bit there, uh, today, you know, I, I'm just, I just want to, like, you weren't around for this, but there was that Appalachian state season opener in, in 2018, I think mm -hmm. it was. And I really should remember his name right now, but Appalachian State's quarterback had a career kind of game. I mean, he just caught fire, had a bunch of momentum, nearly rode that wave into giving uh, the you know, App State an upset victory in Beaver Stadium. And I was starting to wonder with, with Basilak because he was completing some throws like uh, you know off platform. He was yeah. getting you know maybe some lucky moments down the field with how the ball was bouncing. And you're starting to wonder: Are we just starting to see one of these special kind of afternoons? He was 16 of 20 passing for 192 yards and two touchdowns at halftime of this matchup. Again, we, we just don't see quarterbacks have that kind of success against this Penn State defense. And, and that includes last year when, when Michigan pretty much said, J.J., give the ball off or run it. We're not going to have you pass it against uh, against Penn State. Uh, and, and second half, though, as we said, tail two halves of the defense. Basilak, 9 of 19 passing. For 62 yards, he threw two interceptions. Uh, Zeki Wheatley had the second one. Tony Rojas made, made a real strong play to pick up the first interception. Uh, they found the kryptonite for Basilak, uh, but I think that, you know, by the way, he played for Tom Allen uh, at Indiana when Allen was the head coach there. And Allen coming out of this matchup as he gets together with these guys in, in film session and some extended self-scouting periods with a bye week, I think you know, obviously the vocal point is how do we prevent a start like this from happening again? Because if you find yourself on the wrong end of this kind of a quarterback performance and you're in a big 10 matchup, you may not have the ability to find the shovel soon enough to dig yourself out of that situation. Yeah. I I'm very curious what the, how the deep, what the defense takes away from this and how they, how they move forward and some of the lessons that they learned from this. I think that like you talked about, hearing some of those defensive players talk after the game, I think is, is something that'll really resonate with them. And I, I don't think it's a wake up call necessarily, but I do think that for some of these players, it definitely checks your confidence a little bit because coming into the year, this group was really, really confident, uh, especially given how they played last year, it was completely deserved too. Um, a lot of pieces moved on, but there was a ton of confidence in the pieces that were moving up because there's a lot of guys who had been around. Uh, even if they hadn't played a lot of football, they were seasoned and they had, had seen different things and, and gotten out there in different situations. And when you perform like you did last week uh, against West Virginia, I mean, why wouldn't you feel great coming into a game against Bowling Green? Uh, you know, these are 18 to 20 four 25 year old kids. I, I don't know how old some of those six year seniors are, but it's pretty natural uh, to have, you know, a, maybe a little bit of a letdown. Um, it didn't really seem the case based off of what players were saying, mm -hmm. but I think that that's a blank that we can kind of fill in uh, given everything surrounding this game. You've got a bye week next week too. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how they come out of it, but it does sound like that Tom Allen 
know, resonated with these guys, whatever his message was, it got through and we'll, we'll see how they carry it forward because, you know, they're, even if like UCLA, Illinois, Illinois, like those aren't, that's not necessarily top of the top big 10, but those are power four teams. They can test you. Illinois is given a game to top 20 Kansas right now. Um, they'll be curious to see, but Tyler, I have a, you know, talking about, you know, not seeing a game like this and seeing a defense discombobulated a little bit. I have a, a quick pop quiz for you. Okay. That, that I, I thought of when we were starting. So since 2021, so post COVID, my first year on the beat, Penn State's won 28 games. How many of those? It, we could just call this the gallon area era. Everyone around Happy Valley just calls this the gallon era. I, I yeah. wasn't going to say it. I was, I was waiting for you to say it. But how many of these games, how many games, including today, or how many games in the past two years did Penn State win by single digits? Win by single digits. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, off the top of my head, I can think of – and you're saying go back to, to post-2021 or post-2020? Including starting at Wisconsin 2021. Okay, now. well, I'm going to – both those those openers those couple of years, Purdue and Wisconsin, were, 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 were narrow margins. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm going to say that they maybe won – is this like only the third or fourth game that they've only won in single digits? This will be this today was the fifth. The so fifth. Okay. 16 10 over Wisconsin, 28 20 over Auburn in, in 2021. You had the Purdue game in 2022, and then the Indiana game last year. Right. I and mean, so look, I mean, we've heard it like Penn State is one of the like, uh, except for today, people lost some money on them, but like <laughs> they've been one of the biggest like. Go cash your ticket if you bet on a bet on the big favorite here. Like Penn State covers spreads and they do it like consistently. And so when it became clear that not only was the spread in jeopardy for this game, but the outright outcome, this was really like uncharted territory. And again, the only thing I was starting to feel, the only similar sense I could explain it to you is what it felt like in Beaver Stadium in the 2018 opener when the team had such high hopes and all of a sudden found themselves on the ropes against Appalachian State. Yeah, I mean, you, unfortunately, you don't get to hang banners for covering the spread. But I, I just think that it's, you know, we just haven't seen Penn State in a game like this where they they pull it out. I know that in in 2021, even when they were losing all those games, um, I think they, they were all close. It was all, you know, within 10 points in that margin. Um, they lost close to Ohio State and Michigan last year. I mean, really that Michigan game in, in 2022 is the only time since I've been here that we haven't seen them be fully competitive. Yeah. Peach Bowl own category, uh, yeah. you know, per usual. Um, so it was just, it was very different today, I think. And to come out of that with a victory, I, I think it gives you a little insight into the character. Of this team gives you a tiny bit of insight into, you know, how they'll respond maybe when the going gets tough. Because Drew Aller talked about it in, in August. Like, how do you react when things aren't going well? That was a really big talking point for him in the offense last year. I think we saw the offense pick up the pick up the slack in the first half, which in the past, there's been these all these games that we've been watching, and it's like, okay, that offense needs to make a play. That offense needs to do something. And it's usually the defense that does something, not the offense. You know, today offense picked it up in the first half. Defense picked them up in the second half, and you, you got to the victory. But I just thought the dynamic today, from from those perspectives, once we get past the struggling with a team you should have, you know, boat raced. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it, it's kind of interesting. I didn't pick up any kind of like, you know, I didn't see a thousand yard stares from these yeah. Penn State players, like wondering what just happened. They didn't seem shell shocked. I know they didn't lose, but they didn't seem like. Like they were one searching for answers. I, I think they're curious. I think they're probably anxious about going into that film study. It's, it's not going to be a very comfortable situation for a lot of people. And that's how it works. And, and look, your, your growth for this team is going to come through some uncomfortable moments. And this is kind of the real first test for that for them. And, and uh, even with the defensive players, it seems like they're confident that they found what they needed to find in halftime in the second half of this game. Let's go over to the offense, Daniel. And, and, and I mentioned you had big plays uh, pretty early for, from this offense, really picking up where it left off. 
against West Virginia. Uh, you had Omari Evans uh, coming up with another big play. That's kind of been his be bread and butter lately. 29 yard touchdown reception uh, that, that brought Penn State within 17 14 after falling behind 17 7 early on. You had Drew Aller uh, finding Nick Singleton for a beautiful touchdown pass. Uh, and those guys are really connected. That was a little bit later in the game. I'm, knowing, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think my point here is. Andy Kotelnicki's offense and its explosive traits were very apparent to us. What wasn't there today and what felt like it was holding Penn State back was the ability to remain on the field. And James Franklin harped on that a couple of times in the postgame podcast. And I know that's going to be a central part of, of their self-scout moving forward in offense is sustaining these drives, getting more play opportunities, and having thus the opportunity to get more playmakers involved. I, I know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a big number. 17 points for, for Bowling Green before Penn State runs its 10th offensive play. Um, so, Daniel, when, when you think about the body of work today, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between, what did you make of Penn State's offensive output? I think that you can make kind of the, the tale of two halves joke uh, a, a little bit there. But when you talk about what James Franklin was talking about with staying on the field and sustaining the drive, uh, I have that the drive chart up and – in the second half, they they had the sequence where they they score early in the third quarter to go up 27-24, uh, I think. Uh, and then they have these three straight drives that one ends in an interception in the end zone by Drew Aller. Then you have four plays and a punt, three plays and a punt. And the game was still in the balance, and you're thinking, oh, they're, they're letting Bowling Green hang around. Like, you you can't do this. You don't get rewarded uh, when this happens. And I think if you face a more talented team in the Big Ten, that kind of thing won't fly. That that won't work. Um, and so I, I think that that's where the offense felt a little bogged down, where you felt a little uncertain. I would be interested to hear what James Franklin and Andy Kotelnicki would say after going back and looking at those drives again and self-scouting and and sorting things out and being like okay what what can we do different next time um and you saw penn state look a little discombobulated there too where drew aller you know, loses 23 yards on a sack which was just like baffling i know that people said that there were free rushers and you know that someone was a turnstile on the offensive line but like there's no excuse for that you, to run that far backwards in in a play and not get rid of the ball not you know, to, to avoid that. But what did you think about Drew on the day? Um, because there were a few moments that I turned to you and, and I just felt like that is a play that, that he was not capable of. Maybe he wasn't, maybe he was capable, but that he wasn't going to make in 2023. And unfortunately for Penn state, two of those plays today ended up not being completions where, where he's working from like doing great work inside the pocket, then outside the pocket and then resetting himself and throwing the ball on the move. Once was to was a Catron Allen where, where the ball was ultimately it was ruled incomplete. Maybe it wasn't Catron Allen. I might be throwing him. On yeah, the there, there's a Catron. It was Catron. Yeah. And then the other time was Omari Evans. Before Omari Evans caught that 29 yard touchdown, mm -hmm. that was maybe the most impressive uh, that I've seen Drew Aller between the snap and the and the release of the football. Um, it would have been a big game down the field on a third down throw to Omari Evans. That was dropped. But I, I thought overall, again, the 23 yard sack wasn't pretty. He threw a, a poor interception looking for Harrison Wallace, but he kept taking chances. Like even after some of those moments, he kept throwing the ball downfield. We didn't see him connect with Harrison Wallace today, but but generally speaking, in an adverse situation where any kind of hiccup could have set them back or could have really put that upset alert flag raising above Beaver Stadium, I just thought that he had the, the right responses for the most part. And he continued to show what that extra athleticism, maybe what his comfort level with the new play caller can do for this team. Yeah, you, you talk about two of his most impressive individual plays ending up being incompletions. And then you had two more plays that were either incompletions or didn't count that I think showed what the mindset is. There's that deep ball to Harrison Wallace, where I think Drew hung it up just a little bit too long. Uh, Wallace had his guy beat, but the ball hung up. Uh, Wallace had to slow up a little bit, and the the defender was there to break it up. That was the, you, that was a dagger kind of throw. That was that was with a few minutes remaining be, before mm -hmm. Nick Singleton was able to get a touchdown. That was like going for the kill shot, and he was about a half stride short on the throw. It seemed like, 
And then you had the Omari Evans touchdown that got taken off the board because of offensive pass interference, where that was another play where they chucked it down the field. They said, okay, we're going to throw it to the fastest guy on our offense downfield in a matchup we like and let him try to make the play. Um, I think that those two plays also showed where this offense is and the attitude of it and the swagger that they have and, and how they want to play. Um, I think that that really stood out to me too. Uh, but I, I think that Aller is just, he's, he's really showcasing the tools right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, that touchdown pass to Nick Singleton was just like a dart and he put it only where Singleton could get it in a tight window. He threw it before Singleton had even turned around. Like that was just the type of play where it's like, okay, yeah, he's a pro. There's another one. He had another play like that early in the game. That was an incompletion. I don't think it was the Omari Evans drop. I'm I'm completely blanking on it right now. But I remember being like, "Oh, that's an that's an NFL throw. That's a that's a pro throw." Um, and so I, I think we're really seeing Aller comfortable, willing to move around. He did again did some things with his legs. You know, ran for that touchdown. Um, just looked, I thought he looked really solid. I've been really impressed these, these past two games because kind of like what we said all summer, you can talk about it, but at some point you got to be about it. And that's what we've seen. You know, going back to, going back to, the say, we just didn't get to see Drew work against Penn state's defense much in the summer. <laughs> so it, generally speaking, we just didn't know. I think, I think I will say after 120 minutes of football, if I close in my mind's eye right now, I close my eyes and picture what Drew Aller is as a quarterback it has evolved more than I thought it might through the first couple of games, just in, in terms of his ability to orchestrate this particular offense, his ability to prolong plays and the confidence level that he is clearly showing in letting the ball fly downfield more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in terms of the attitude of this offense and Aller, the drive that really sticks out to me is the one in the second quarter to make it 17 to 14. You know, what you talked about in terms of, Things were not going well in the early going, but we did not see guys you know, dropping their heads, you know, thousand yard stairs or whatever. We saw this offense come out and land a really strong counter punch. You go 75 yards in three plays for a touchdown after you've gone down 17 to seven. I mean, that's an offense that comes out and means business and is ready to go. And that really stood out to me because I, I felt like at times last year, we never really – they were not in too many situations outside of uh, Michigan and Ohio State where Penn State needed the counterpunch, where it was a drive and it was like you need to do something or this could get away from you. Mm -hmm. The only time that really happened, it felt like last year, was in the Indiana game. And really more than anything, that just felt like desperation. That was kind of like, oh, we actually don't have a choice now. <laughs> we have to throw the ball downfield. We have to – kind of let it rip a little bit. Whereas they came out and it was just super well done, calm, collected. Um, it was just a really, really nice selection of plays that I'm trying to pull up right now. You know, you had 22 yard completion to Tyler Warren, 24 yard gain to Nick, by Nick Singleton, 29 yard pass to Omari Evans. I mean, well, I mean, you were it, searching for one of those kind of plays for quarters <laughs> on end last year. Yeah. And it's like the thing where, it's like kind of like so simple to be like, oh, like you put each of those plays in a vacuum and you're kind of like, oh, like, why don't they just do that every every drive, every play? Like, it looks so easy. It made so much sense. I just was really impressed with that sequence because the quick strike Penn State offense, like I think we're you know, we've seen some like two play 70 yard drives where it's like ends up being a you know, a short play, then a big Nick Singleton gain or like in the Rose Bowl, long pass to Andre Lambert Smith. But we haven't had that a sort of a, as much as you can call a three play drive sustained uh, just to go and just pick up those big chunks, just take big steps forward. Yeah. Like I was just like, oh, this is a different offense this year. This team is a little bit different. And I think that's something that can play in the Big Ten. That's something that's going to win you games. Now, we were kind of joking that, oh, man, this defense needs to catch its breath. It needs to to you know be on the sideline, regroup a little bit, and you're telling them to go back on the field like a minute later in game time. But I think you'll take the seven points there, and 
I think that was a really, really big juncture in the game because we we're like at 17-7. Like this could get yeah. away from you and this could be bad. And remember the uh, you know that that final possession in the first half at West Virginia where we figured they'd take a knee, go in a half time, yep. try to get the ball. Two plays later, they're in the end zone from one side of the field to the next. So yeah, Andy Kotelnicki thinks he has the pieces to drive the ball down the field, score in a hurry. And thus far, he's been validated in, 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 in that in that kind of outlook regarding this team. We've made it way too far without uh, addressing what Tyler Warren was able to accomplish. I, I really quickly want to, to to note that Nick Singleton and Omari Evans fascinates me what they have done since Mike Yersich was fired. <laughs> uh, I mean, these uh, these two are are a front and center for me and just saying individually how have things changed. Nick Singleton now has three consecutive regular season games with 100 plus rushing yards. First 10 games last year with Mike Yersich as the OC, he had maxed out at 80 rushing yards. Omari Evans now has four straight regular season games with a 20 plus, 25 plus yard gain. The first 10 games last year, his longest catch was five yards. So all of a sudden, these guys week in, week out are coming up with big plays. Nick Singleton obviously is more of a front and center component of what this offense is. But I think now Omari Evans, even with that drop today, has inserted himself as a field stretching figure for this offense. And in speaking with Omari Evans after this game, you know, one thing that, that we were discussing was that defenses now have to account for him. You know, it's one thing when you think that you've got a speed threat on your team in preseason camp, but it doesn't mean much when a defensive coordinator is getting ready for your offense and the time of uh, the effort and the investment he's got to, to put into that player. Now it's on film for Omari Evans, and it's on a film a few times for Omari Evans, and we know what Nick Singleton, the field stretcher, has looked like in the past, what it's looked like more recently. He had the put-away score 41 yards on the first play of that possession for Penn State to make it a 34-24 lead for them. Um, Katron Allen over 100 yards on the day as well. I wanted to make sure I mentioned a bunch of these guys because Tyler Warren is where we got to finish with uh, on the offensive side of the football. Eight catches, 146 yards for the fifth-year senior tight end. That is a record for Penn State tight ends ever in a single game. Uh, he was over 120 yards in that Peach Bowl in, uh, last December. That was a heck of a performance. This one was even better. Uh, seven of these eight catches were for 10-plus yards. Seven of these eight catches were for first downs. Um, he didn't reach the end zone like a few of his teammates, but four catches uh, for about se 70 yards during the first half, four catches for about 70 yards during the second half. Uh, and Katron Allen and Nick Singleton both will tell you he is – so impactful as a runner. Go watch that 41-yard run that I just referenced for Nick Singleton that put away the game. Look who was clearing out the left side there, Tyler Warren. Uh, and so James Franklin called him the most complete tight end in the country two weeks ago. This is the kind of performance, regardless of who it's against, that shows you he can be number one target material for this team, regardless of what's happening at receiver. And also he can be Mr. Consistent when maybe there's some moments of instability going on over the course of the game. If you love tight end play, today was a very, very, very good day for you because you had Tyler Warren uh, on the Penn State side and then on the Bowling Green side, Harold Fannin Jr., 11 catches, 137 yards, one touchdown. Uh, he looked really, really good, kind of like your – I mean, both of them looked like your – when you imagine a tight end in your head and the types of plays that they can make receiving – that's what they looked like today. But I think with Tyler Warren, the, the thing that stood out was just the chunks of yardage that he was picking up. Uh, I have it up right now. 12 yards, 15, 22, 30, 10, 29, 23, and 5. Uh, but to be able just to get chunks of yardage like that, I mean, I I did I pulled up a stat last week where I did the, you know, the, the small sample size Olympics where you looked at uh, you know, Drew Aller's yards per attempt uh, last year it was 6.8, which is just not a healthy number or no. not. That's not like a high level uh, quarterback number. Um, you know, in game one <laughs> at West Virginia, 12.7 yards per attempt. Uh, I did not do the math today <laughs> before. I can help you out there. He's about, he, today was about 10 and a half yards per attempt. Uh, I just looked at it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, just that, just these chunks of yardage that they're picking up has just been really impressive. And to do that with your tight end, I think is is something that is, you know, really good for Penn State. Um, 
you know, you look at last year during his career, Theo Johnson was one of those guys. I think was it 2022 was averaging 16 yards a catch. Like he showed you could be a, a downfield threat. And Tyler Warren was more of the the station to station guy. Um, you know, a little bit, you know, not as much of a down downfield guy. And for him to have that be in his game this year and to be used like that shows that that full complete tight end thing. I mean, you know, J- James Franklin saying it, that's not praise that I think he gives out often at the same time he's sticking up for his guy and you take a lot of and I know that we're all high on him because we've seen him so much but there's still a little bit more that I feel like you want to see from him as being a, a number one like the alpha the that option in a receiving game and this type of performance like we saw today and a little bit like what we saw um in the Peach Bowl that kind of makes you think like okay yeah he can do this he can be that guy. He can be when we get to Mackey award season, you know, be, be among the semifinalists, the finalists, when we get the draft season, he can be in that conversation to be the first tight end off the board. And I think it's going to be really exciting for us to follow and, and for Penn state fans to watch. When Theo Johnson was going through his pre-draft interview process this spring, before he landed with the New York giants in round five, he was telling everybody who would listen that, that Tyler Warren's going to be at the top of their tight end board. Uh, this upcoming NFL draft. And uh, you talk about what he can do at this size. He's six foot six, 260 plus pounds. And trust me, he looks every bit of it. We've had a chance to spend a lot of time with Tyler lately. He's gone for at least 14 yards on a reception now in eight straight games. So this is nothing new. Uh, yeah, this is something I think that we, we've retrained ourselves about Tyler Warren, but he finished last season as, as a, a kind of a more vertical threat than we anticipated. Because I think when I pictured the first half of last season, when it really started to emerge, it was more boxing out in the end zone, you know, mm-hmm. coming up with some contested catches, using that physicality. Now he's racing away from people. And, and it's just it's really special to watch. And, and you can understand why the combination um, has Kodal Nicky really excited. And Tyler Warren is, is probably the last person to talk about Tyler Warren. Um, and so when we caught up with him after the game, didn't want to do a lot of that. He said he you know, certainly has a lot of respect for the tight end position at Penn State. Guys, he shared the room with guys who came before. So a standalone number one in single single game uh, yardage list is pretty special. He's only four touchdowns away from Pat Fryermoose all-time career record here at Penn State. Uh, but, but when it comes to to Warren and, and moving forward, I think the most important thing is here, we didn't talk about Harris Wallace at all because he didn't get a catch today. And Warren's point to us was, this is just how it's going to be. We saw that the tight end was going to be the hot read today. We anticipated that might be the case, uh, Tyler said, during game prep. And that turned out to be the way. He said last week it was Trey Wallace who was the hot read. He said next week it could be somebody else. It could be Trey again. could be me again. But I think that he makes a good point. There have been recent seasons here at Penn State where it feels like there is a definitive number one target or or there's a guy that you've got to really lean on. And if he's not producing, then there's going to be problems. You know, we got a two game sample size here where the Penn State offense puts up 34 points on both occasions. Different kind of game flow. But, you know, you've got. Warren at 146 this week. You got Harrison Wallace with the career game last week. You got both running backs hitting 100 yards. And so I think at the end of the day, Andy Kotelnicki is following through on what he told us in terms of week to week, we're going to identify the strengths on our personnel, match it up with what the defense has. And when those weaknesses combine with our strengths, it'll show up with explosive plays. And so right now you are presenting a bit of a pick your poison component. I think you get more, more production out of that receiver room as we move forward from other guys, maybe Julian Fleming, Caden Saunders gets healthy. There's, there's more potential for that receiver room, but I think the early returns are this isn't an offense, this isn't a quarterback who's going to have to hang his hat on a primary weapon. Yeah, I think there's a lot of these factors at play where the amount of options that Penn State has, I think that it's one thing to take them at their word coming into the year and, and forecasting things for ourselves a little bit. But now that we're in the season and you look at these first two games, Tyler Warren, Nick Singleton, Katrin Allen, Trey Wallace, and I'd put Omari Evans in that top group in terms of guys that we've seen Penn State go to in big moments and and feed the ball a little bit. And you know, that's a lot of guys to spread the ball around to. Uh, you know, Trey Wallace didn't have a catch today, and it didn't necessarily feel he didn't necessarily feel super absent 
because of that. I think because you're moving the ball with Tyler Warren and it's the thing where you don't need Trey Wallace to go off for a hundred yards. Other part of it is the amount of opportunities that Penn state has right now. I think part of it was because in the second half, they could not stay on the field during the, those three drives when they're trying to put the game away and just how these games have gone. I mean, we're through two games and Drew Aller has what 37 total pass attempts, which is a, a number that he did three times in a game last year alone. Hmm. Uh, and two of those games were losses. So who knows if you want him to be throwing that much, which is a different game flow conversation. But I think that we're just seeing that like for this pass catching group, there's not a ton of opportunities right now uh, because of the way that these games have gone and the way that they're playing. And, you know, if what we saw today from this Penn state defense Maybe it changes the you know your outlook a little bit where, okay, they might end up in a shootout or two this year where you're going to need Drew Aller to throw it 40 times. And then maybe that's when you see you know two guys with eight catches or two guys going over 100 yards or 80 yards or, or something like that. But I think so far, I think kind of the fact that we haven't seen someone get force fed, I think it bodes well for this offense. I still dealing with a tiny sample size, but at a certain extent, you've only got 12 regular season games. So the sample size is not going to be as big as you'd like it to be in a lot of cases. But I, I do think that we're just going to see the the shape of this offense change week to week. And I think they're sticking to their word right now when they're saying, we'll look at what the defense is doing. We'll attack that, which means this guy might get a lot of work one week. He won't get a lot of work this week. And through two games, we've seen them stick to that. And I think that's a big positive in terms of your long-term outlook. Receivers combined for three catches, 37 yards, and a touchdown. Julian Fleming, who, who got announced as a starter today, one catch, three three yards, his first career catch in a Nittany Lions uniform. And then Omari Evans, two catches, 34 yards, and a touchdown. But because of what was going on around them and the other weapons that were involved, it didn't feel like that was an issue today. Uh, but again, it does feel like that ceiling. There's a lot of room to grow at receivers still. And so what does that look like as they get there? It's it's you know intriguing, to say the least, for this offense. Um, let's talk about some players of the game. Really quickly, do want to mention Kobe King, very clutch uh, of the ability to field that onside kick when, when Penn State was leading by seven in the final minute. He took some contact. He turned his body, was able to get that ball in his possession. So key move there by the captain, the linebacker. But talking about some individual players of the game, we went over Tyler Warren. He was awesome. Um, Tony Rojas on defense. So, you know, you asked me kind of we were getting later in the game. You said, has there been really an MVP type performance on on, on defense? Has there been? And we were kind of waiting for it because then not really. And then Tony Rojas, who earlier had just really got on the uh, got on his uh, horse, went down the field, tracked the ball and knocked it down on a third down earlier in the game. And, and that was when when. Uh, when they were just dealing the ball through the air wherever they wanted, that that was a big moment. But later in the game, he comes up with an interception. And Rojas told us afterwards, working against Nick Singleton and Katron Allen on a daily basis since she showed up on campus last year, speed's always been a big thing for him. That That's, that's going to be you know, one of the premier traits that leads him on the football field for the rest of his career. But he said his coverage skills have really taken a boost from working with those guys. And I was pretty blown away by by how seamless he looked in a couple really key situations where if you're a little bit early, it's going to be a costly penalty. If you're a little bit late, it's going to be a huge gain. And so I, I thought he you know, walked that line very well today. And if he doesn't make each of those plays, we could be having a very different conversation on this podcast. I, I did like what we, we saw from Rojas today. I thought that interception was just a really, really nice play in coverage where it looked like he was trailing the receiver and then suddenly he's just right there in perfect position and is able to haul in the ball. Uh, that PBU on the trick play early was, I, I thought, a re another really impressive play where the timing really lined up perfectly. I think that there are still some areas for growth for him, which for all the good things we've heard about him and all the praise we've given him, still a sophomore. Uh, today was his second game getting really, really significant snaps um, in the run of play. He had one play where uh, he took a pretty hard hit from the running back where, you know, he didn't 
it was, it was just a weird play where he wasn't squared up, wasn't really going to wrap up the the ball carrier, and uh, the the runner just lowered his shoulder and you know pushed him off. Um, so I, I think you're seeing a young player that you're going to hope and trust will get better on a weekly basis once he's out there um, with, with more and more play. But yeah, I mean, we were, we were kind of waiting for someone on the defensive side of the ball to, to step up. You know, I, I had the little placeholder text in where I said that like a lot of Penn state defensive efforts over the past couple of years, it was more about the combined unit as opposed to one guy. And that's just how the flow of the game went. But Rojas came through for me for me there at the end and, and came through for Penn State as well. Daniel, let's finish up with a couple injury notes here because uh, we observed some of those. Uh, we saw K.J. Winston exit this game during the first half. He, he was on the sideline without his helmet the rest of the way. Guy who was the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week last week, and we talked so much this week about how those safeties lived up to that elite billing in week one without him on the field. Then you saw Jalen Reed playing more of that traditional safety. You saw more three linebacker looks, kind of a standard defensive look. You saw more of Zion Tracy playing some line because Jalen Reed was out back playing safety. James Franklin said it did impact their ability to dictate the defense, how they would have preferred to do that. But when you remove someone of this caliber like KJ Winston, that can happen. No details from James Franklin afterwards, as you well know, probably out there listening, he doesn't get into injuries unless they're of the season ending variety. So no news on KJ Winston, but any kind of absence there is going to be a big deal that we got to discuss, but they've got a bye week that they're going into. And then over at tight end, Daniel, they got Khalil Dinkins back involved. He had a catch today. As usual, he moved the chains with that catch. He has high impact reception in his career to this point not a bunch of them but they make a difference um but unfortunately a surprising scratch for us was a- andrew rapelier and he ended up you know showing up on the field using crutches and you know, this is a guy that we spoke with this week we saw him on the field wednesday i wrote on friday about him having this opportunity to take the next step for himself and unfortunately it seems like penn state is going to be without rapelier for a bit and i'm just going to leave it there because james franklin uh, you know, said he wasn't prepared. He just doesn't really know quite yet. Uh, he's got to have those kind of conversations before he's going to have a conversation with us in a public setting uh, in a post game press conference. But when you see a guy on crutches, um, you know, it's usually not a great thing. It's not something that you're just like, oh, you know, it's, he'll be back tomorrow. So we got to monitor this. And it's an unfortunate development because Andrew Rapley is, is a guy who as a redshirt freshman is truly viewed in this in this facility as someone who could step up and be a Tyler Warren-esque figure down the road in his career. Yeah, James Franklin said that whatever happened with Rapelier was very, very recent. Uh, that was his his direct quote. Um, and you know, we spotted Rapelier, you know, through the binoculars on the sideline, and he was sitting kind of behind the bench, uh, up against the wall away from potentially any action that could come to the sideline. And he's someone that we've heard from James Franklin, uh, where I think the quote, I don't have it in front of me, but it was something along the lines of football is everything to this guy. Like this is what he is eating, sleeping, dreaming, et cetera, um, you know, at at all hours of the day. And I think that you, you play body language, facial expression, doctor a little bit and, you know, it was someone who looked pretty dejected. I think at one point when I was watching through the binoculars, Bo Perbula went over to him um, you know, on the sideline and, you know, they, they shook hands and chatted for a couple moments and Perbula, you know, you know, hit patted him on the shoulder before going back to the sideline. But, you know, I think that it's, it's tough, you know, especially when you look at the timing with Dinkins coming back and thinking that this room is back at full strength. And now this, I think that your focus really goes to Dinkins and to Luke Reynolds um, as to how exactly you're going to make this work if it is something extended and however that works out. So, you know, maybe when we talk to James Franklin next week during the bye, he'll have an answer for us or have some more information for us. Um, But we'll see. But, you know, a, a bit of a surprise for us. And I think that, you know, the fact that you saw the offense operate pretty well without someone that you would think was probably game plan to be a pretty big part of what they do. We know how much Penn State likes to use its tight ends. I think that you saw a pretty good adjustment from both the offense and then from Luke Reynolds and Dinkins maybe coming in with different roles than they potentially expected. 
Reynolds, they might have a hard time you know, keeping him <laughs> to the four game mark now. I know James Franklin as We're has, halfway there has been, yeah, he's been careful to say, you know, that, that, that Reynolds hasn't entered that green light territory, but if Rappelier is not available for, for some extended time here, it's, it's hard to see uh, the former five-star tight end being stuck on the sideline moving forward. Uh, he actually got the start today uh, in his second career college game, along with Tyler Warren. We'll see what the snap counts look like. We'll have our snap counts breakdown up on the site on Sunday. But again, it was the Tyler Warren show at tight end with, with others involved, but he was the first uh, man involved alongside Tyler Warren at that spot. Let's finish with Sanders Sahedak because in a game that they won by seven points and it was a lot more narrow than we thought, he was two for two on field goals. Both came in the first half. The first one was from a 40-plus yard distance after he missed from that range last week against West Virginia. And then you looked it up after he made his first kick. You got to go all the way back to 2022 the last time he made a kick uh, at a field goal. Of course, he's been involved in extra points. Um, so it's been a long journey for, for Sanders to Haydak. And, and I think the funny thing here is, Daniel, we, we finished out the preview pod and saying Penn State could win by 40, but if Sahedak misses a couple field goals, it's still going to be a talking point. Now Penn State you know, has to kind of squeak by with the victory, and Sahedak made two field goals that proved very important to that process. Yeah, I, I think that you saw what you wanted to see from Sanders Sahedak, which was – Sounds simple, but come out and make your kicks. Uh, they weren't necessarily, they didn't, I don't have the exact angle or what the wind was like on the field, but they weren't necessarily just chip shots for him. Um, like you said, 40 plus had to put a little bit of leg into it, which we know he has. It's about that control and you know, getting it down the middle. And I, I think that that's a, a really good positive to take out of this game. Um, we'll see when the lights are on, maybe when the pressure is a little bit amped up. Maybe when we get into Big Ten play, when you go on the road, you know, the, all these different circumstances that can factor into things. But you wanted to see a bounce back performance because at this point, given how short his leash was last year and how quickly Penn State went to Alex Falcons, you kind of felt like that it was getting down to it with Sanders Sahedak. You didn't know how many chances Penn State was going to give him this year. Um, so I, I think that that's a positive. You take it, move on. And, you know, kicker, I feel like more than any other position is can really be week to week because it is so stark. They talk about it in terms of determining the winner of the competition. It's not a lot of variables. It's not like someone's dropping your passes or different things like that. It comes down to you. So this can still be week to week, but I think Sanders Haydak getting that confidence, giving the fan base confidence in him, I think is a good development to come out of today. And just worth noting, every single game that we cover and talk about has layers to it. Some of them are <laughs> not pretty. Some of them are very promising. Um, and so we had a lot of work uh, to, to kind of go through this particular matchup. We're not done yet. We're going to come back on Monday, uh, get the bye week started with an episode where we'll go back and break things down. By then, we'll have more opportunity to gain some context on what we actually witnessed. We'll go back and rewatch some of this stuff, which isn't always apparent when you're in the press box. And we'll come back to you. I do want to note, our, I know I've been touting our four-episode uh, schedule now that we're in the season. We're not going to do four episodes during the bye week. We love you all, but we're not going to do four episodes during the bye week. We'll come to you with two episodes during the bye week, the first of which will be on Monday. Again, we'll take a look back at this one. We'll start to set the stage for, for some key questions going into a week off. But, Daniel, really weird day at the office <laughs> today at Beaver Stadium. Um, it started like a really rainy day. The sun came out, and then Bowling Green put up a bunch, a bunch of points on us, and then all of a sudden Penn State battled back. And, and there was just so much to kind of deal with that we weren't anticipating – and if folks want to go back and, and check out our pregame podcast to see how just wrong we were with this projection, that's okay because we'll own that label with just about every Las Vegas industry titan who projected this game to be a five-touchdown victory for Penn State football. Uh, Daniel, 2-0 Penn State. I guess that's the bottom line right now. Uh, appreciate your hard work, and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Tyler. On behalf of Daniel Gallon, I am Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast. We'll catch you real soon. In the meantime, go catch out our coverage coming out of Bowling Green matchup at lions247.com.